Welcome everybody to another live stream here at the National Museum of Australia. Um, with the image that you're looking at right now is the Paddle Steamer Enterprise, which is the object that we're gathered here today to talk about. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country upon which we meet today. That's the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is John Olanine and I'm a curator here at the museum and I'm joined today by uh, one of our senior conservators in charge of large technology, Nathan Farrow. And the object that we're talking about is the paddle steamer enterprise. It's one of our most important objects and for me actually it's one of the most important historical objects in Australia. Now why is that? Uh, for me the reason is that the enterprise really encapsulates so many incredible stories about the Australian experience. There's exploration with the opening up of the vast interior of this country. There's conflict between indigenous people and the white settlers. There's water, that constant question on this continent of, of floods and drought. There's wool, uh, the wool industry. Uh, Australia rode on the sheep's back for over a century. There's power. On the micro level with the steam engine that drove, drives the vessel even today, and on the macro level with the Murray-Darling Basin's involvement with the Snowy Hydro Project. There's stories about the environment through the river red gums that went into the construction of the hull, and there's tales of knowledge. The riverine wisdom of the crews that made the enterprise hum, and there's the loss of the indigenous knowledge that left when, the, uh, when white settlers took over their traditional lands. So all of these incredible stories brought together in one object. That's why it's important to me. Now, the story of the enterprise goes all the way back to 1797, when the first merino sheep were brought to New South Wales. It was 16 years later that, that the first commercial shipment of wool went back to England. And once that happened, then the wool industry in Australia started to take off. Now, as we know, huge tracts of land are needed for sheep to run. And by the middle of the 19th century, uh, land, was, land was really in a way running out for the wool industry. Now, they knew that there was thousands of square kilometers of potentially productive land in, uh, in New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland, but it was too far from markets to make it economically viable. In 1850, it was the South Australian government that, that took a step to try, and, to try and change that. They offered a 4,000 pound reward to the first two vessels that could navigate the Murray River from the mouth up until its junction with the Darling River. And this led to the construction of the first paddle steamer on the Murray River, the Mary Ann and it was constructed by the Randall brothers in Gamaracha. They built, the, they built the hull there. It was transported over the Adelaide Hills and was launched in Manham in February 1853. Although it didn't actually get its maiden voyage until August of that year because of the river levels. Now, at the same time, Captain Francis Cadell was in negotiations with the South Australian government to get economic guarantees for the construction of a vessel that he would master on the river. And he was able to get those, and he got that ship constructed in Pyrmont, in Sydney, and knowing the political situation that he was involved in, he named the ship the Lady Augusta after the governor of South Australia's wife. Now, the Lady Augusta came south from Sydney. She passed through the Murray Mouth in August 53 at the same time that the Mary Ann was leaving the Manham area. So the race was on. And on the 14th of September, the Lady, the Lady Augusta passed the Mary Ann around about the junction with the Murrumbidgee River. And on the 17th of September, 
uh, Captain Cadell arrived in Swan Hill just a mere four hours ahead of the Randall brothers. What the race did was it proved that the river trade was possible and it became, it became a seismic shift in the economy of Australia in the 19th century. In the middle of the century, the economy had been dominated by the gold rushes. But as the century wore on, more and more of the colonies came to be running on the sheep's back. Now, the, the Palace Steamer Enterprise was constructed by the timber merchant William Keir in Yachuca uh, in 1876, although she wasn't actually launched until 1878. She was built from River Redgum, as so many of the Murray paddle wheelers were. Uh, her, her wood actually came from the Barma Forest, just north of Yachuca. Uh, she was especially constructed to have a very shallow draft, so the, um, the amount of the ship that was underneath the water, and that enabled her to have a very long steaming season compared to some of the other vessels there. And uh, the, the vessel still operates today with the original single expansion twin cylinder 12 horsepower engine that was built by the Beverly Iron Company in Hull, Yorkshire. So over 140 years of service, the, the paddle steamer enterprise is one of the oldest still functioning paddle wheelers in the world. And in that time period, she's been, she's been a cargo vessel, she's been a fishing boat, she's been a houseboat, she's been a showboat, and now she's one of the most prized objects in the National Historical Collection. So let's take a, a look at a video now about how the vessel is used today at the museum. <laughs> The steamer Enterprise was um, built on the banks of the Murray River in Chuka between 1876 and 1878. And so it was launched into the Murray in 1878, um, very close to where the centre of Chuka is now. The Enterprise is one of the oldest steam powered vessels in the world today. So what we have here at the National Museum really is of international significance. And the fact that this boat has survived has been wonderful. It's because it has had so many um, iterations in its time from being a towing boat, it was a floating store on the banks of the Darling River at Wentworth, it was a private pleasure boat, it was a fishing boat, and it survived long enough to be restored by the National Museum as one of its key exhibits. One of the great benefits of the Enterprise was it's a shallow drafted vessel. That would mean that it could trade longer on the rivers than all of the other larger boats. It could get away earlier in the season when the melting snows were first starting to put water into the rivers and it could trade for longer before the rivers dried up at the end of the steaming season. So our boat, the Enterprise, was able to get further up river and be of more use to the stock and station agents bringing the supplies back down to the railhead. It was a very, very uh, flexible boat. The river trade was very complex. To navigate these thousands of miles of rivers on the Darling, the Murrumbidgee and the Murray River, the Asian city Chuka would have to know the river heights and they would send off the boats of the lowest draft first and they would be followed by the much bigger boats. So smaller boats such as the Enterprise would bring barges of wool from further up the river, say Brewarana or Burke, till larger boats could then tow more barges of wool and bring them down to the railheads at either Echuca or Morgan in South Australia, where there were massive wharf facilities. The Enterprise is a wooden hull vessel, so to keep it in survey, it needs to come out of the water every two years. When the boat is on the slip, it also gives the engineers a good chance to strip down the engine and to check the boiler out to make sure that it's in safe condition and can keep its certification as a steam-powered vessel. Being afloat on the lake, the vessel is out in all weathers, which means that the volunteers and others have to keep the boat well painted and the decks well sealed to stop water coming in to the boat. As volunteers, we bring the enterprise to life. 
When we start off in the morning, the vessel is cold and dark, but by the time we've got steam up, our vessel is singing. Welcome back, everybody. Now, uh, anybody out there who's watching, I know there's quite a few out there already, if you have any questions, please send them in on our Facebook feed. Uh, but to get things going, we've prepared a few questions earlier on. So, uh, Nathan, one of the most fascinating aspects of the vessel to me is the engine. Can, can you explain to us in, in very simple terms how a steam engine actually works? Yeah. Well, a lot of people aren't familiar with steam engines. Um, it's not a technology that's widely used today, um, but it's quite a simple system, really. Uh, think of it as a kitchen kettle. You heat up the water using a, a power source. In this case of the Enterprise, it's timber or wood. Um, you heat up the water, it expands into steam. That steam is harnessed through a piston and directly uh, through the engine is um, linked to the paddle wheels themselves. So it's, that's a, a simple version of what's <laughs> really going on, but it's taken centuries of development to, yeah. to where we are in the 1870s with the Enterprise. That's right. There was probably, there was at least uh, you know, 150 years of technology that kind of accumulated into the engine that the Beverly Iron Company developed there. Um, now, that, that engine is over 140 years old, and this day and age when we, we're happy to get 10 years out of a, out of a car or a truck, uh, that idea of a 140-year-old engine is fantastic. There must be some really specific conservation issues around that, though. Yeah, um, I guess it's a testament to the Beverly Irons Co. and how well they manufactured their steam engines. Um, but it does still raise challenges for us, um, both because of the age of the, of the metal itself. Um, we've got corrosion issues, uh, but also other challenges. It's a skill that uh, the engineering skills that it takes to keep a boiler like that going aren't widely known or available. Um, and cer certainly some of the materials aren't as available as they once were. So we're working um, with volunteers, with contractors, with people tr um, that have, have those skill sets to be able to continue operation on, the, on a vessel like that. Yeah. Uh, we gotta, we got to put a, a, a shout out here to all the volunteers um, who, who work on the Paddle Steamer Enterprise. I mean, this incredible vessel wouldn't be in, in the state that it is right now, you know, still functioning on Lake Burley Griffin without the dedication and the passion of that group of people. So huge thanks to the volunteers out there. Absolutely. Now, we got a question coming in from the audience. Uh, and the question is, how did, how did paddle boats navigate on the rivers? Were there maps? Uh, and that comes in from Chakri. Chakri, thank you very much for that. Okay, now that's a great question because um, the government didn't actually produce maps of the Murray Darling system, um, not, not to the specifics of river navigation. So uh, the way that uh, navigation worked was that the masters of the ships themselves created their own maps through their personal experience. And uh, we're very fortunate here at the museum to have a couple of those maps in the National Historical Collection. And what they are, they're essentially large rolls of calico cotton that are, that are drawn with the imagery of, of the Murray or the Darling or the Murrumbidgee River. And on those maps, they actually place the particular, the particular navigational obstacles that they would have faced. So for example, if there was a particular snag there, then they would have uh, they would have marked that on the map. If there was a settlement, if there was a particular a particular sandbar and a bend in the river, uh, all of that would have been included on the personal maps of all the captains who piloted those ships. So, um, wow. Okay. So Nicholas has called in a question here, uh, and the question is: Can you please tell me? why the name is the Enterprise. Now, I don't think this has any relationship to the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> I think it's the fact that 
William Kerr, who was uh, the timber merchant in Uchuka who constructed the original ship, was a business person. He built this ship for business purposes. The idea was that it would travel the river, it would be able to take household goods, household goods to different properties throughout the Murray-Darling Basins and be able to bring back wool to markets that would eventually be shipped overseas. Uh, the idea was it was an enterprise. It was there to make money, and I believe that's the reason why William Kerr, in 1876, originally called the vessel the Enterprise. Okay, we have another question coming in from CJ. How did the museum acquire the Enterprise? Now, that is a really good question because there is a long lineage of ownership uh, for the Enterprise. Um, William Kerr, of course, originally owned it. The museum didn't acquire it until 1984. Um, and the reason that the museum Actually, I should say that the, the Enterprise was really the first, uh, the first significant object that the founding director of the museum uh, uh, actually, actually acquired for the collection. Um, he believed, at that point in time, in the, in the early 80s, in the early 80s, uh, the, the government was debating, debating whether they were going to fund a, a, a large exhibition space for the National Historical Collection. And to kind of forward that case, um, the director wanted an object that people could really engage with, an object that told multiple stories about Australia in a very tangible way. And he kind of fell upon the idea of uh, a Murray River, Murray River paddle steamer. And so they actually went out and they went down to Yuchuka and, and actually surveyed a couple of different vessels down there and decided upon the, the, the PS Enterprise at that point. Uh, now, the PS Enterprise at that point was in nowhere near in the same shape that she is now, and there was a four-year uh, program of, of refurbishment for the vessel from 84 to 88, and eventually, the, uh, the Enterprise was shipped up to Canberra, I shouldn't say shipped, it was transported up to Canberra uh, on a flatbed truck and was launched again in, on Lake Burley Griffin in time for, in time for the centennial celebrations. Okay. So uh, I have a question for Nathan now, and the question is, um, now the PS Enterprise has two, two paddle wheels to it. Um, you know, when we think of that traditional iconic imagery of paddle wheelers on the Mississippi River in North America, we think of that large paddle wheel at the back. Why do the Murray River paddle wheelers have, have two, two, two wheels on them? Well, I, I think there's actually two answers that come close to being able to answer that one. Um, with the Murray River, it's very different than the Mississippi River, for example. Mississippi is a big, wide, straight river. Um, the Murray River is a winding river, and you, it's um, got really tight bends. For every kilometer of distance that the river travels, it actually goes about three, uh, lint, um, three kilometers. Um, so you require a ship that's small, uh, and compact, and also has maneuverability. Uh, the second reason is, the simplicity of the engine and the design of the vessel comes into it. So with a stern wheeler, for example, uh, you have to have another transmission system to get from the engine to the rear wheel, whereas essentially the side wheelers are direct transfer from the engine through a paddle shaft to the wheel assemblies. Now, Nathan, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask another question around that because the, the wheel itself, the paddle wheel itself, of course, is uh, probably the, the heaviest used piece of the vessel. And that must, that must present all kinds of conservation issues around that. Can you talk a little bit about the conservation issues around the actual paddle wheels themselves? Absolutely. Um, the PS Enterprise is fairly unique in that it's a very, very early vessel and also has a different designed wheel to some of the other Murray River paddle boats. It's got a cast iron hub, which contains uh, timber spars that go out to the paddles themselves. Um, over time, this is a, considered a wear item, essentially. This is the main um, 
point where you're contacting the water and transferring that power from the engine to the water. Um, so in time, these things get looser and sloppier, and um, they require replacement. Uh, when I first came to the museum, uh, we were experiencing quite heavy uh, and significant wear issues with our paddle assemblies, and so they needed to be replaced. So one of the challenges in replacing an 1870s paddle wheel assembly is where do we get the skills to do so, and where do we get the materials to fix it? Um, with that, we engaged the uh, expertise of a shipwright who's um, familiar with timber boats. His name's Mark Leone, and he helped us to come up with a solution for replacement spars for our vessel. Um, one of the challenges with the timber, we could not get the size and the amount, um, consistent amount of timber that we require. Um, in this case, the original spars would have been red river gum. It's a fairly scarce wood these days, so we thought about looking at alternatives. The alternative that we had come up with was to keep keeping with the Australian theme uh, an Australian spotted gum, which is a, an Australian hardwood, but we had to actually um, splice and put splines into two separate pieces of timber in order to laminate them together and be able to create the composite in the width and, and depth that we required for these paddle wheel assemblies. So it was quite a large project. Yeah, you can feel that's quite wow. a dense wood. That is heavy. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay, so how much would one of these spars actually weigh? Like this, this must feel like a kilo, just a small piece right here. Yeah, I'm estimating that each spar is probably 17 kilos. And you've got to appreciate there's 48 spars in total on it. So it's quite a bit of heavy lifting and, that is, and quite a bit of labor to put it in place. That is a lot of work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we actually have a question along those lines that's just come in from, from Diana. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really directed towards Nathan. I mean, are you concerned that these types of skills that are involved in the maintenance of a vessel such as the Enterprise are being lost? Absolutely. Um, I think for the most part, hand skills in general are being lost. Mm. Uh, we're focusing more on digital age. You're watching this on Facebook. You're probably not sitting there whittling away a piece of timber. <laughs> um, so th this is a challenge, but it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for places like the museum to be able to bring out these skill sets. Um, we would bring, like in the case of the timber work, uh, we brought in a heritage shipwright. But on other projects, for instance, like our uh, a Daimler project, we might bring in a a pinstriper or a hooper on another project. So um, there's also um, lost skills like it, simply like these uh, rope making and being able to work with the uh, ropes these days is a lost skill. So we seek the information um, or seek out people that have the information. Yeah. Wow, okay, Lena, Lena has sent in a question here which is a great one and she asks, my daughter wants to know can kids go on it? Can they go on the Enterprise? Absolutely. The Enterprise is, is open uh, usually on weekends when the volunteers are available. And every few months, we actually have a toddler's program that functions on the Enterprise, which is so much fun to get little kids out there onto the actual vessel show them how the steam engine works, show them how the paddle wheels work, and get them engaged in a piece of living history. Well, I think we're, I think we're moving into the final questions now. Uh, again, thanks everybody for sending these in. So this is a question from Catherine. Are there any differences between the water in the lake in Canberra and the Murray River water in terms of conservation? Do issues Oh, okay, do issues like blue-green algae present problems? Nathan, that's a good question. Um, it, certainly, it does create some issues. And some of the issues aren't so much with the timber or the hole, which seems to be holding up quite well. Um, it's also about the intake of the water that is used from the lake that runs through the boiler. Um, and it, in order to compensate for that, um, the boiler, we use special additives, uh, which help to um, preserve the interior of the boiler itself. Um, this is closely monitored. Um, we do pH testing and particulate solid testing to ensure that um, we have an eye on that 
um, to prevent any further um, corrosion issues. So, yeah, so, but it certainly does pose a challenge. That's great. Well, everybody, um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, this has been so much fun, uh, you know, getting the word out about the enterprise and being able to talk to Nathan about these really specific conservational aspects to it. I should say that uh, I hope that once the country opens up again, that people out there can come into the museum, check out the, check out the enterprise well, when you're here. Please keep in mind also that uh, as of next year, we'll be opening up a brand new gallery here at the museum, uh, the Life in Australia Gallery. That's a tentative title right now, uh, but it's looking at, it's an environmental history gallery looking at Australia through the lens of the Anthropocene. And there will be objects from the Enterprise related to the Enterprise in that gallery. So you'll be able to see the Enterprise not just down on the lake, on the dock, but also within the museum itself. So again, thanks to Nathan and everybody out there who tuned in. I, and I really want to say thanks. There was a big crowd who tuned in today, and we really appreciate that. And we hope that you'll join us again next week for another live stream from here in Canberra, the National Museum of Australia. Thank you. <laughs>